All right, guys, the other day I posted a video asking you to leave comments about any advice you want on the guitar, any tips you want from me, anything that you're trying to improve on, and that I'll respond in the comments and try to help you out as much as I can. You guys left some amazing comments and amazing questions. There was a lot more than I thought there would be. Everything ranging from, you know, beginner stuff to more advanced stuff like phrasing and techniques and creating solos and riffs and everything in between. So I thought I'd make this video today to respond a little bit more with some of those questions and show you some of the things that I would do with my students and walk them through to kind of help get over some of these obstacles or understand some of these concepts a little bit better. I want to try to answer as many as I can so that no matter what level of guitar you're at, you can get something from this video and learn something new and have a different way of looking at things. So let's get into it and look at some of your questions. All right, so first question here, this is a great one. I want to be able to improvise proper solos instead of just following a scale. Of course, we can't have a solo without the scales, but I hope you know what I mean. I do know what you mean. And the scales, you know, they're kind of similar to learning words in a language. They don't really mean anything until you can put them together into sentences that are coherent and mean something. So it's the exact same thing musically. With learning scales, you can learn all your diatonic scales all across the fretboard, but if you don't really focus on what you can do with each scale, it's gonna just end up sounding like you're running through scales or, or playing through shapes that you've memorized instead of creating a coherent musical idea. So a great exercise to do, and you can put on a backing track to make this even more fun, is use something like a pentatonic scale, but stick to a very small section of the scale. Give yourself, let's say I'm in A minor pentatonic. I'm gonna stick to just the bottom two strings of that scale. And I'm going to try to make that sound as interesting as possible. So again, this is a little more fun over a backing track, but just give yourself like four notes or two strings or just a you know small little shape. Sometimes with students, I'll also just give them one string. They, they have to create a solo with one single string. And again, it just makes you think differently. It makes you think more melodically. So if I'm using that A minor scale, It's gonna force me to try to see how much I can get out of those four notes there. I'm gonna to try to use you know, all the interesting techniques I know, hammer-ons and pull-offs and slides and bends and legato and everything in between to try to make it sound as interesting as possible. Here's another great question, kind of similar to the first one. How do I improvise better? I really liked your jazz player in a rock gig video where you played jazzy lines over a rock progression and I'd really like to improvise in a style similar to that. So that solo, for those of you who are not familiar, that was from uh, Guthrie Govin's song, Wonderful Slippery Thing. The whole series of uh, those videos is always a cover of a popular solo. That one happened to be a Guthrie Govin solo. But still, we can look at kind of what's going on in that solo and uh, take some ideas from it, which is always a great thing to do. So when you're trying to incorporate jazzy lines or, you know, incorporate a little bit more of a fusion sound to your playing, what you can do is also look at the notes not in the scale. So if you know a full, let, let's start with the pentatonic again. If you know your pentatonic scale really well, you can look at the notes outside of that scale to add extra interesting flavor. Now, generally, they're not notes that you would want to stay on because if you're over a backing track again in, in A, and I hit notes outside of the scale. That just sounds, you know, bad, <laughs> harsh to the ears, and you probably don't want to hear that too much. But I can throw that note in as what's called a passing tone, which means you just want to pass through the note. So again, that same note, that, you know, horrible note over that A minor chord, I could always add that in in a way where I'm going, I'm 
kind of using that note, but I'm going through it as a passing tone. And then you can elaborate on that to make your lines even jazzier by sticking to, or using a lot of the notes that are, again, outside of the scale. So if I take the pentatonic, and I kind of fill in a lot of the blanks, Again, you want to treat those uh, notes outside of the scale as passing tones, but you can come up with some really cool lines. So you can hear that it adds a lot of extra flavor, but a lot of those notes outside of the scale, I'm not staying at them, I'm not accenting them, but I'm using them again as passing tones. Another amazing question, any advice on how to learn the fretboard, both visually and orally, thanks for your work. So learning the fretboard is probably one of the most challenging things as a guitarist, because as I was explaining to a student recently, you can approach the scales and intervals in a linear way across the string, kind of like you would on a piano or a keyboard, but it's almost as if we have, you know, six keyboards stacked on top of each other. And it's like, you know, turning into like three-dimensional chess or something like that, where there's so many different ways to approach the fretboard. So my advice on that is to try to learn as many different approaches as you can, because that's really when things start to click and come together. So you can learn your scales vertically going down uh, across the strings in one position. You can learn them across one single string and make sure you can play the different intervals of, you know, let's say a minor scale across a single string. You, you visualize the scale differently when you do it that way. You can approach scales where it's, you know, three notes per string. You're playing three notes on every single string all the way down. You can use the cage system. There's so many different perspectives and my suggestion would be to try to learn as many as you can because uh, as I'm improvising, I'm able to see the fretboard in different ways. I can see my pentatonic boxes, I can see my diatonic notes, I can see triads, I can see chord tones, all that kind of stuff. And that, that just comes from a lot of practice of approaching the fretboard in a variety of ways. All right, now we have a technique question. Sweet picking is hard for me. Slowing down doesn't seem to help any tips. Sweet picking is generally hard for everybody. <laughs> it's a very challenging technique and it's always a technique that I suggest to students to be very patient with and take your time. For me personally, in my own personal experience, sweet picking was one of the techniques that took the longest to develop. And it's, it's a technique you have to be very patient with. So now when you say slowing down doesn't help, I would suggest you know starting nice and slow. And you can either stick to uh, a small arpeggio shape. Let's take a you know, three string arpeggio. You want to play that nice and slow so that all the notes are super clear and with sweep picking you don't want any of the notes to bleed together so you don't want to hear any of that. You don't really want to hear the harmony of the notes. But at whatever speed you're comfortable with, you have to start slow so that it's controlled because having your sweep picking controlled is the most important thing. You don't want to end up uh, sweeping through an arpeggio where you lose control of the notes. And it is common to hear that where, say, if you take like a five string arpeggio, you hear like the first note and the last note. Though. You don't want that. You want to hear all the... all the individual notes of the arpeggio. So my suggestion would be start nice and slow, make sure your sweeping motion is consistent. So meaning that you don't wanna have an individual picking motion, but you wanna have a nice steady motion which allows you to play that you know efficient sweeping technique when you're applying it to a longer arpeggio
All right, next question. And again, another great one. You guys have some amazing questions here. How to learn muting strings on electric guitar after many years of playing classical guitar with nylon strings. The fingers on the left hand look like an arc. The right hand is well above the strings as well. Struggle to learn palm muting. So this is a, a great question because a lot of players who start on acoustic, they start with a certain right hand technique where typically you see it kind of anchoring with the pinky down on the guitar and that's totally fine for the acoustic guitar but generally when you go to electric guitar and especially if you turn on some distortion you're going to notice you're going to be getting a lot of extra noise from the strings even if i don't touch them so check this out if i play the first string down here i haven't touched any of the other strings but that's going on at the same time as i'm playing so instead of anchoring down here on the electric guitar, you want to have your palm resting on the strings that you're not using, the ones that are above where you are. So if I'm picking the first string, I'm keeping my right hand palm on almost all the other strings or pretty much all the other strings that I'm not playing. So when I stop, and I maybe I'll uh, not stop that note with my left hand. it's up to this hand to mute the strings, right? So you're not hearing that going on as you're playing. So it takes some getting used to, but you wanna picture that you're basically palm muting the strings like you would if you're playing a, a palm muted riff. And just don't be afraid to keep your hands sitting on the strings as you're playing. All right, next question. Basically, I've been in touch with guitar for more than six years, that's awesome. But I started taking it seriously for the past six plus months, but I don't really see any progress Sure, I can play uh, Green Day power chords, but I can't shred or have that musical sense. But I just feel stuck. I don't know what to practice daily and I can't afford a teacher, so I gotta stick with YouTube tutorials. Well, let's take a look at that today. <laughs> so that's a great question. Now with progress, one thing to understand with progress is it's, it's sometimes it's very difficult to notice your own progress because you're hearing yourself play every single day. I compare it in a similar way to, you know, going to the gym and working out every day and looking in the mirror. Day to day, you're not going to see, you know, a t huge change or outstanding results. But if you take a picture of yourself and look back on it in, you know, four or five months, you may notice a big difference. It's the same with guitar. So what I would say suggest is whatever you're working on at the moment, whatever's difficult, whatever's challenging, take a video of yourself playing it now, but don't watch it for, you know, three months, four months and continue to practice, of course, and keep working on that piece. When you come back to it in a few months, I would be shocked if you don't notice progress, right? And you just, you might surprise yourself how much progress you've actually made. But again, day to day, it's very hard to notice for everybody. Now, when it comes to what to practice daily, uh, I did a video recently on how to put together a practice routine. And uh, one a quick thing that I suggest with practice routines is try to have some variety, no matter how much you're practicing in the day. It could be uh, 30 minutes or it could be three hours. Try to practice a few different things. You wanna have some you know, technique workouts in there. Definitely have a song that you're working on that's challenging you, right? So pick a song that you like, you love the sound of it, but also it's a little tough to play. And that's just a really fun way to build your technique, work on your rhythm and your timing and everything like that. Um, and then also, if you're at that stage, I would suggest incorporating some improvising into your practice routine. I find a lot of guitar players don't work on improvising consistently, and it's a really, really great way to work on and challenge uh, yourself as an all-around musician, meaning you know all the different aspects of music. Here's another great question. So when I'm soloing, I feel like I get stuck at one speed and can't go slower or faster. And if I do, I get off beat. I can start fast, but I can't slow down or I can start slow, but I can't speed up. I guess what I'm asking is how to smoothly transition for uh, slow to fast and still sound good. So that's a good question. And one thing a lot of guitar players don't pay enough attention to when improvising or creating riffs is, is rhythm and trying to make the rhythm as interesting as possible. So for that, what I would suggest is, you know, again, put on like a metronome or a backing track. Backing track is always a more fun alternative. Stick to just a few notes. Again, we're gonna take our pentatonic scale just because it's familiar and a lot of players know it, but you, you can do this with anything. Just take a couple different notes. 
and try to rhythmically make that really interesting. So if I, uh, you know, keep a beat going. really fun to do that so just try to focus on rhythm and trying to make a few notes sound really interesting as you can see there I'm going between slow and fast speeds to try to keep it uh, interesting and musical and stuff like that but that's an aspect of uh, improvising that is often overlooked and can make it really really interesting here's a great question that I think a lot of us uh, are interested in and it's how do I manage to entertain people with my guitar? I only know a few songs and riffs and I always seem to forget most of them when I try to play in public. We all do for sure, or at least I do. I want to impress people with my guitar skills, but it's so hard. Do you have any advice or stuff that I could learn? So it's a great question and I feel like a lot of guitar players feel that way where uh, yeah, you want to impress and you want to be acknowledged for what you can do on the guitar. Now, my advice for that is if you're playing for, you know, the average public, if you're playing for friends and family and stuff like that, it's not always the stuff that impresses you on the guitar that would impress them. So as an example, you know, if I start throwing in some like crazy, you know, fusion chromatic lines and, and I know the, the theory behind it and I know what I'm doing in that uh, musical sense, it can impress me or, or it can be interesting to me. But then sometimes, you know, your average, uh, you know, friend and family, they just want to hear some songs that they know. And if I went into playing some Beatles music or something like that, they probably enjoy that even more. <laughs> so what I would suggest is try to get a few songs uh, kind of build up a little bit of a repertoire that you know the songs well enough that if anyone asks you to play them you can play them on command and you don't need the tabs or the music in front of you to play it and try to learn the song you know from start to finish just because that's a great thing to do and it's a different discipline to learn a song from start to finish than it is to learn bits and pieces of different songs so essentially just try to learn some you know popular songs that people would know but it doesn't always have to be the most amazing thing in the world to improve impress the average person I would say. All right, next question. I feel like I am stuck in a pentatonic box. I can play fast and improvise, but all my solos sound the same. I want to know how to like move around the fretboard. So that's a great question. I think a lot of guitar players, uh, you know, get to that stage where you get really comfortable with the pentatonic box. We've been using it so far in uh, this video and you want to expand on it and you want to get to something a little more interesting. So what I would suggest is first try to learn the pentatonic scale across the fretboard. So if you're really familiar with root position, which most guitar players are, I would say, try to learn the other four positions of the pentatonic scale across the fretboard. Now, even though it is the same scale that you're playing, each position, the notes just kind of fall on the fretboard differently. So it actually does allow you to play different ideas and different phrases, even though, again, you're using the same scale. But if I go to, um, I don't know, second position here, just the way the notes fall on the fretboard is gonna make me play them a little bit different than in root position. So in root position, I might go. But in second position, I, I'm not gonna play that exact same phrase because it won't really work with how the notes fall. But I might. Play something a little bit different so again it's the same scale but it does become a lot more interesting for you when you can move it around the fretboard now after that what i would suggest is to then look at some of the modes and learn the full minor scale you can learn some of the other uh, modes as well like dorian and phrygian and mixolydian and all these uh, cool you know scales that provide a lot more flavor so instead of having say the pentatonic box <laughs> If I have a Dorian scale, 
I have a lot more to use and I can get a lot more interesting flavor because of those extra notes. So here's a question that I wanted to include. <laughs> Why I still haven't quit playing the guitar, although I suck. <laughs> now I'm, I'm laughing obviously just at the, the wording of the uh, <laughs> question, not the person, of course. Um, and I think that the answer is if you enjoy playing, then stick with it and, and keep going with it. And it doesn't, you know, don't really uh, have too much of an expectation of how much you should be improving or how much you should be able to do by a certain point. Everyone's different and everyone has a different, you know, learning experience with the instrument. It can be a very different path for everybody when they learn the instrument. So I would encourage you to stick with it. Obviously enjoy it, keep going with it because obviously quitting will never make you better. So stick with it and uh, it sounds like you love it. All right, here's a quick question. Any tips on being able to move my fingers faster? So for speed, I would always recommend working with a metronome because the metronome is a great way to track your progress. So it's really hard to tell if you're trying to play something fast completely by yourself without a metronome. And I try to play something right now, you know, trying to play it fast. And then I come back to it the next day and I play it again, again, without a metronome. It's hard to tell if that was faster than the first one, how much faster it was from the first one, if it's still in time and consistent, but a metronome will let you know that. So you know if you're practicing something at 80 BPM today and you're locked in with the beat, maybe tomorrow or the you know few uh, days afterwards, you can try to get to 85 BPM or even up to 90 BPM. But keep in mind with a metronome, those small increases and in increments, they add up over time. So if you're able to increase something five to 10 BPM in a week, you can imagine over a few months how much that would add up and uh, have a tremendous increase in your speed. To take that same thought a little bit further, this question is how do you really alternate pick fast? I've heard people say everyone has their own method of doing it and I have tried multiple ways but still have excess tension and struggle to hit and maintain high speeds. I have always been convinced that you should not feel any tension whatsoever when alternate picking but I'm starting to doubt that is true, what do you think? When uh, playing the guitar, uh, also another thing that a lot of people don't think of is the muscular endurance of trying to play, especially something new and something challenging. So as an example, with the endurance is like, you know, if you're someone who practices 20 to 30 minutes every single day, then you're probably not gonna be able to get on stage and play a 90 minute show all the way through. Your hands and arms and stuff will be killing you by the end of that, or even probably not keeping up, right? So it's the same thing with speed. When you're practicing for speed and you're trying to go faster, you want to find that threshold where it's starting to get pretty difficult and you can't quite do it. You're wanting to find that threshold. And at that threshold, you're probably gonna feel a lot of tension in your uh, right hand, your arm, and your fingers as well. They may get very tired from trying to play that speed. But as you keep practicing it and trying to push it a little bit further, the tension at that speed will ease and it will become a lot easier and then you can try to push it and go even faster. Sometimes it's also a psychological trick I use with my students too, where let's say you're practicing something at you know 100 BPM and you're having some difficulty with it, bump up the metronome to 110, 115 BPM, which is obviously harder, but when you force yourself to just try your best and keep up with it, it's probably not gonna be perfect, but just force yourself to try it. When you come back to 100 BPM, you're probably gonna feel some relief and feel like it's easier in comparison to the higher speed. That tension in your hands is, is normal if you're pushing to a new threshold that you're not quite able to do yet, but you keep practicing and that will go away and you'll be able to play even faster. All right, this might be one of the highest upvoted uh, questions on the video, so I think a lot of us are uh, curious with the answer. It says, I struggle with improvising. I feel like it's either a scale or just me playing randomly and hoping it will be the right note. I can't seem to find a balance and I don't even know where to find it. So that's a great question. 
And that's coming back to, you know, phrasing, but again, also kind of how you approach scales and stuff like that. So two things I would do with that, just to kind of uh, try something new, is instead of approaching a scale as just a scale, so let's take, you know, our minor scale. So I could approach that scale as just a series of notes and just kind of uh, go through it somewhat aimlessly and hope the notes that I play match up with the chords and sound good and and it's a little bit of chance that way, right? Now, the other method is to look at what you're playing over. So whether it's a backing track or something that you've created, look at the chords that you're playing over and see if you can kind of outline those chords a little bit in your playing. So let's see, if I, if I have a, a chord progression here, I'll, I'll play, um, let's see, I'll just play uh, A minor. <laughs> And D minor. So as I'm playing over that, I'm trying to stick to the notes of those chords to kind of outline the progression. And it gives me a little bit more of a structure and kind of um, a, a path or to follow to where I'm trying to uh, outline those chords. It also keeps you on your toes a little bit more because you can't just get lost in the scale, but you have to be aware of where you are. Now, the other approach that I would suggest trying is it's really easy for a lot of guitar players at all levels your fingers kind of get away from you. And when you go to improvise, I, I find this happens for me all the time and it can be frustrating when it happens where I pick up the guitar, put on a backing track and start to improvise. And I realize that my fingers are on autopilot and they're just doing what they normally do. And... And it may not sound bad, but like you're not really thinking your way through the solo. So this is actually pretty difficult to do, but what I would do is put on maybe like a slow backing track, a melodic backing track, and don't play any note until you've really thought of which note you wanna play next. Again, it's much harder to do than it sounds, but start slow and maybe stick to say a minor scale or something like that. Really make a conscious decision of where you wanna go next so that you're fighting the muscle memory and you're not allowing muscle memory to take over and just do what you normally do. And that is not something that I would always play, right? So I'm just trying to really consciously use my ear and almost like listen for which note I wanna hear next. Next question, how to write melodies for riffs or soloing like you're displaying in this video, which is the video that I invited the comments for. So what I suggest doing for writing riffs or melodies is uh, a lot of people just try to start off too complicated, too sophisticated right away. So a great way to come up with an interesting riff or an interesting original idea is start with as simple of an idea as you can. So maybe start with, um, let's say two power chords. We're gonna start with just. So that's a pretty simple idea, just two power chords. Now we can embellish that and keep going with that, right? So maybe I'll add an extra note to each chord. Maybe I'll do... Uh... And then from there, maybe I could even 
either change the note So it's starting to become more and more interesting. I could arpeggiate that and play the notes one at a time. But the point is to just sit there and just keep working with it and keep working with it. You know, think of like Tim Henson from Polyphia. You know, I, I don't know this for sure, but I can I can bet that his uh, writing process is, is similar in that way, where his riffs are so complicated, there's so much going on in them that he probably sits there and just builds on them and builds on them and builds on them until they're this like crazy guitar piece that like very few of us can play. <laughs> Another great theory question, besides the pentatonic scales, what are some other good skills to learn? So I'm gonna show you exactly what I show my students because if you stick to some of the minor based modes at first, and even if you don't have a full understanding of modes from a theory perspective and how they belong together and all that kind of stuff, you can at least start with a few of the shapes to try to uh, use them in your improvising or use them to create original ideas. Now, the nice thing with the minor based modes is that your pentatonic scale is still within all three of those modes. So we're gonna look at three different scales you can try to uh, mess around with and, and play with, which is the minor scale, the Aeolian. So all your pentatonic notes are within that scale. You can also try the Dorian shape, which is fairly similar. It's just the minor scale with a major sixth. And then you can also try the Phrygian mode, which is a minor scale with a flat second. Now, unlike the pentatonic, these scales are a little more specific to what you're playing over. The great thing with the pentatonic is it's so universal. You can play over pretty much anything in any style and the pentatonic is gonna work and it's gonna sound great. With these scales, you have to be a little more specific as to when to use them if the chord progression uh, aligns with them. But the best thing to do is at first, just search up backing tracks that are specific to those modes. So you can type in like an Aeolian backing track or a Dorian backing track or a Phrygian backing track and try to get used to those scales and the shapes of them. They're gonna give you a lot more flavor than your pentatonic scale. And you're also gonna notice that those scales have a very different sound from each other. The Dorian is gonna sound quite different from Phrygian and from the minor scale. So you're gonna get um, you know, a new tone from these scales that way. Here's a really great practicing question. When practicing techniques, is it better to concentrate on one till you nail it, then move on to the next or practice each technique a little each day? So it's definitely, pract or it's definitely better to practice uh, all the techniques you can cover each day so that they kind of improve simultaneously at the same time, right? So uh, when I used to put in, uh, you know, hours and hours of practice each day, um, I would spend a little bit of time on, you know, alternate picking and then it would be sweep picking and then it would be legato technique. Everything you can think of doing, you, tapping, spending some time practicing tapping and everything, but a little bit each day. And that way you don't just get really strong at one technique and can't do all the others. This is a similar question to before, but a, a great question is how would someone practice creativity and thinking outside their mental box? Again, like I kind of said earlier, it's a, a good idea and what I do with my students is restrict what you have to use. So when it comes to improvising, um, what I would do is either you know play the chords myself or have them play over a backing track and give them like one string to use. So when you're uh, improvising, you can only use the second string, that's it. And you have to, again, try to make it sound as interesting as possible and try to make it sound like you're not restricted in any way. So usually that gets you out of doing what you normally do. So any of your kind of like pentatonic box type stuff. <laughs> You can't do that because you only have the second string to use now. So whatever backing track you're over, you have to try to think of. Yeah. 
and and try to think of like fun ways to make it creative and again sound as cool as possible all right last question here how can i determine the names of the chords that i play i can come up with these great sounding chords that just pop into my head but i never know the chord actually is or as far as its name goes I don't know if it's an add nine, a diminished, all that stuff. How do I figure that stuff out? So I would try to get a basic understanding of chord construction. Basic meaning just like your major chords, your minor chords, diminished, augmented. Those are all what's called three part chords because they're all built up of three notes. So if you take, you know, the scale that it's derived from, let's use the major scale as an example, it would just be the first, third, and fifth note. So all those, all those chords I mentioned just have different variations of one, three, five. You could have a flat three, you could also have a flat five, you could have a sharp five, you could play with the notes a little bit, but it's always derived from the one, three, five of the scale. First note, third, and fifth any way that you play those notes together so those notes in this case happen to be c e and g i play c e and g in any way it's the same chord it's the same name no matter where i put the notes now from there then you can get into more complicated chords you can get into four part chords where you add in the seven so you're playing the one three five seven that's where you get like major seven chords minor seven dominant seven more interesting chords like that and then you can it's basically endless with chords then you get into uh, add nines and suspended chords and you know all that fun stuff now one thing to understand is if you're coming up with kind of different complex chords you get to a point where the same chord let's take this chord here it's a, a cool different sounding chord Depending on which note I'm considering my root note, that same chord it could be called a variety of things. So if I'm basing it off of the F sharp here on the fourth string, that would be a minor seven flat five. But if I'm basing it off of the A, having an A in the bass, then it's like an A minor six chord. This is an interesting thing with chords that you do see this is if I base it off of a D, now even though I'm not playing the D note, but maybe in the song the bass player is playing the D or the you know other instruments are playing that low D note and I just play the rest of the chord, which again is the same chord shape, then it's a D9 chord. And again, I haven't changed the notes in any way. Could be an A minor six, could be an F sharp, uh, half diminished or minor seven flat five could be a D9. You could call it all of those things and it's the exact same chord. So at that point, if you don't fully understand all the different uh, names that the chord could be given, that's okay. It takes practice and you can learn those, but um, it can get quite complicated. So I wouldn't worry about that too much as much as trying to get a good foundation of your basic chords, your minors, your majors, and uh, understanding the difference between all those chords. So hopefully this video has been helpful. Hopefully this answers uh, some questions that you have with your playing. I really appreciate everyone asking those questions and leaving the comments and stuff. Again, as I said earlier, I love to teach. I love to help people get better at the guitar. So always feel free to leave your comments with stuff that you're working on on any of my videos. And if I see it and I uh, have the time, I'm always happy to respond. So thanks guys. Don't forget to subscribe for future lesson content like this and as always guys keep up the practice